I've been working on that two part series about liberalism and Satanism and Christianity and conservatism. And I realize that there are some things that we need to touch on in the liberalism Satanism video that should probably be expanded upon beforehand. And I was already planning on making this video anyway. So I figured that it would be better to put a couple videos out this week, which can kind of lay some of the foundation for what's going to be explored next week. And so today we are going to go over the top five stupidest baby boomer talking points. We will explain the concept of the boomer, why we have an issue with them, but also why we love them, how these talking points have enabled the destruction of our country. And I'm sure that you're familiar with all of them. So do stay tuned. <laughs> you're so funny. I've never spent time with someone like you before, Anon. We always have so much fun. You're such a great friend. Anyways, thanks for the coffee. Uh, oh, have you met my new boyfriend? Let's get out of here, babe. other ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Heck Off Kami. Let us address the baby boomer question. Let us first, though, remind the audience that the Discord server is back up on the website, so if you're a member, go to the website, join the boys once again. Also, look how much better the image looks. Is this not better? Are the angles not better? Are the lights not better? Our friend Kayla came over, got everything set up properly, so we appreciate that. We love Kayla, don't we, folks? Also, the new merch is going live on the website this weekend for the three-year anniversary of the channel, so be ready for that. But anyways, yeah, uh, some of us watching are baby boomers. Some of us have parents who are boomers, maybe even have grandparents who are boomers. And technically speaking, a baby boomer is someone who was born between the years 1945 and 1965. And ironically, the name of the generation, which is in reference to the post-World War two surgeon babies that this country had because we were riding an unprecedented wave of prosperity and morale. Ironically, the name even references their greatest weakness, which is exactly that, that they grew up in the most prosperous and free period in the history of the country, probably even the history of the world, and they pissed it away. And I've said this before, they were too busy getting high and listening to Led Zeppelin IV to actually push back against the forces which have ultimately overtaken our country. And let me clarify, I don't think that my generation's better I recognize that it, you know every generation is going to have its problems. We don't even know how to cook or fix household appliances, but you know at least we didn't fumble the greatest lead in civilizational history. I don't know. That's just my opinion. And if you know me and all the young people are arrogant, we think we know it all. We don't even know how to fix a toilet. Maybe you should have raised us better. I don't know. That's what always makes me laugh because they'll say, "Well, kids nowadays they have to get a participation trophy for everything. What happened to earning things? Like who do you think is buying the participation trophies for us, dude? Like who's picking them up from the store? It's not us because we are five. The point being that I know that not all baby boomers are like this. Truth be told, I actually really like baby boomers and we're really gonna miss them in a few decades assuming the current trends continue. But that being said, given that it was that generation who ceded all institutional power to the communists and it was that generation who was in power while the managed decline of our country was largely set into place. I do feel somewhat righteously indignant, but anyways, technically a boomer is someone who was born between 45 and 65, but I believe that it's more of a cultural thing. Like I know 60 year old boomers and I know 30 year old boomers because that which defines the boomer is the inability to recognize that things have changed. That's what it is. And I mean no disrespect by that. Like every generation is always going to have a point where they don't really understand what the younger generations are doing. But when we talk about baby boomers, like that tends to be the implication that you're dealing with someone who just doesn't get it. And that's why people my age are Zoomers because we don't have time to not get it. So we got to move speedy quick or else we're all going to end up in mass graves. And one of the greatest examples of this recently 
<laughs> this was at a protest I attended last November. This was the day after the fortified election, and I went down to downtown Detroit where they were counting the ballots for legitimately elected President Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. Some of you actually might even remember watching the live stream that I did at this event. We were in this crowd of people, most of them baby boomers, and there was this huge crowd of people across the street from us who were protesting our protest. And as you can imagine in Detroit, this group of people were largely that's right, they were largely Democrats. And so I'm watching these Democrats, and I'll never forget this because something like just clicked for me in this moment because there was this one particularly boisterous young Democrat woman who was screaming at us, and you know she started a series of chants that said like, F white people, F America, F Donald Trump. And then one of the guys on our side who was a baby boomer, he was dressed up as a founding father, tricorn hat and all, he got to the front of us and he turns around, he raises his hands, and then he begins to lead us in song. He wanted us all to sing God Bless America to drown these people out. And that's when it clicked. This guy meant well, he loves his country, he's probably a good man, but he just doesn't get it. And that explains why our country's collapsing because you have people who think that the answer to I hate you because of your skin color, I hate your country, and we took over your entire country and are gonna punish you beyond your worst expectations. And they think the answer to that is let's sing patriotic songs. That'll change their mind. Do you think they're confused when they say that they hate you and that they hate America? They really mean that. You're not gonna sway them with a folk song. Oh, Oh, and then at that point, I just said, screw it. I'm gonna use actual tactics against these people because song isn't working. So I decided to capitalize on low impulse control, a known Democrat weakness to see if I could get some of them arrested. So I had my megaphone and I just started broadcasting to that particularly boisterous Democrat woman stuff like, hey, are you from Little Caesars? Cause you're hot and I'm ready. And right on cue, she starts crossing the street, screaming at me. The police see this. They start calling after her. The plan's coming together. And then from left field, this Asian girl comes up to me and the boy and she gets right in our face and she's like, you guys are being so disrespectful and rude to her. I'm on your side, but this is so immature. And then it clicked again. Then I try to pull this epic prank to get this woman arrested by simply complimenting her with a reference to a Michigan-based pizza franchise. This woman who was literally chanting, F white people, I hate you, come over here so we can beat your ass. Now I have this little Asian feminist telling me that I'm the problem. And say what you will about conservative women, but if you as a woman approach a man like this and get in his face, that's internalized feminism, whether you realize it or not. Women shouldn't ever approach a man like that. Frankly, if you do, you should expect to be treated like a man. Let's do that actually, right now. You wanna know the correct take on hitting women? Here it is. The whole idea behind not hitting women, as a general rule, Everybody knows, you know, women are your mothers, they're your sisters, they're these vivacious, feminine, nurturing beings. We have to protect them because of that, right? It's not because they're physically weak. That's what everybody thinks, but that's not why. There are plenty of physically weak men that no one would have a problem with hitting. And I think about this because I saw a clip from an anti-jab mandate protest last weekend, headlined by Nick Fuentes, where this woman got right up in this guy's face and started yelling at him because he made like a joke or something. And I just rolled my eyes at this because it's like, yeah, okay, girl boss, you're not tough. The only reason that you're doing that is because you know that you can operate with total impunity because you're a woman. For the most part, no man would ever just get up in another man's face like that unless there was really a problem because he knows that the threat of violence is always on the table. And the worst part, not this crowd, but the average crowd, if this guy had even pushed back at this woman, like just pushed her back, you would have heard all the white knights fall into place. How dare you put your hands on a woman? Don't you ever touch a girl? Okay, well, if you want the benefits and protections of being a woman, then you have to behave like a woman. Those are the rules. If you start behaving like a man, you will be treated like a man. And this is off topic, but it's tied to the broader point of what feminism has done to this country in just a hundred years. We're actually, we're going to touch on that a little bit more in a second. But when you pretend that men and women are equal, which is not the case, you necessarily have to give women power over men to achieve the desired equal outcome. So now women are free to get in your face. They can scream at you. They can push you. But if you even raise your voice to them, they'll cry and file domestic violence charges against you. It is literally given women a license to operate with total impunity and total advantage in every aspect of life, whether it's the courts, the workplace, universities, everywhere but they still get to retain their status as the eternal victims because of weak men with mommy issues who think white knighting will get them laid. Think about that. We live in a society that has artificially elevated women to such a pedestal that most men don't even realize the conditioning. And then when a guy like me comes out, when a guy like me speaks honestly about women, they short circuit. What? This guy's not simping? Well, he needs to get laid. He's an incel. And it's pathetic because they can only conceptualize existence as a man in terms of getting access to women's bodies. Their existence as men is derived and validated from the approval of women, a complete inversion of how things should be. And they can't even grasp the idea 
of not being locked into that framework. Oh, well, you said something mean about women. You must be an incel. Yeah. Okay. Hope she sees it, bro. Hope she sees that. Hope she gives you a crumb. You need to get laid. You need to go to church. We're off topic. There were two clicks for me in that story. We had the tricorn hat boomer and the MAGA waifu, who's actually a really sweet girl. I don't mean to put her on the spot, but understand my mindset at the time, just watching all of this happen around me. We had the two clicks. We went click, click, and then I blew my head off in Tetris. And even now, I'm gonna get people who are like, John, I usually agree with you, but you should never put your hands on a girl. Yeah, frankly, that rule is outdated and stupid. Women don't act like women anymore. And if I saw a woman get in a guy's face, screaming at him, pushing him, hitting him, and he like pushed her away from him, maybe even did a little bit more, maybe did a little Sean Connery mode, I can't say I'm gonna pretend that he's somehow less of a man for that. Like, yeah, being a real man is letting a woman abuse you in public. In fact, I'd probably buy him a beer. And again, obviously, women should be protected. My point is simply that they can't have their cake and eat it too, that is all. But anyways, we get back to baby boomers. Obviously, hindsight's 2020. but had they really put up a fight against the internal threats that this country was facing, we wouldn't be in this position. And I really think that that's what's going on with their patriots with their patriotic songs, all of that. I really think it's a mixture of not realizing that the country they grew up in is long gone and that it will be a miracle if we can get it back and also like a coping mechanism for maybe subconsciously realizing that and just trying to drown it out with the over-the-top patriotism for patriotism's sake. Like, I'm patriotic, I love America, but not in its current form, and people don't understand that. Like, I criticize America in its current form, and people think I'm anti-American that I'm giving up on America. And it's like, aren't you guys the same people who make fun of the body positivity movement and say like, well, we shouldn't be promoting unhealthy lifestyles and unhealthy choices. Aren't you the ones who say, well, you need to, you need to pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and take responsibility. If you have a family member who's a heroin addict, you probably wouldn't spend all your time talking about how great they are and how in a way the heroin addiction is actually what makes them great because it was their choice to become a heroin addict or something. No, the point being that if you love something, you have to hate that which threatens it. And and if you want to solve a problem, you have to identify it correctly. And I love America and I hate the problems with it. And that's my life goal, to make those problems disappear as best I can. A lot of people just wanna wave American flags and sing songs and pretend that everything's fine because it makes them personally feel better. But I actually take this very seriously and I'm not gonna apologize for that. So we will now get into the list. You know, my friend Blake said something one time that made me laugh. He said, it's not a hawk video unless the list doesn't start until 10 minutes in. And it's so true. We just have a lot to say. Had to tell some stories, had to talk about hitting women. Lots on the docket today. But before we get into the list, have you noticed that it's getting crazier out there? Yes? Well, that is because it is getting crazier out there. And more and more of you are choosing to exercise your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms with an American-made We the People holster. These guys are actually more than just a holster company. They are becoming something of a destination for many any patriotic Americans like yourself, go to wethepeopleholster.com slash Doyle. Check out their complete line of patriotic shirts. They're 100% American-made tactical gun belt with a proprietary talent buckle. They even have their own line of bacon jerky. I've been told it's been flying off the shelves. Most importantly, We The People holsters are custom molded to fit your exact firearm for a quick, smooth draw with thousands of options to choose from. Plus a selection of custom printed holsters. You are sure to find just the right fit for your lifestyle. Plus, you can literally buy a holster for your gun with yet additional guns printed on it, which works closely to how in nature things like peacocks and butterflies will display markings to their enemies to make them appear more dangerous, except you're already dangerous because you have a gun, so now it's like it's amplified to the level where the government will just leave you alone. Disclaimer, I don't actually know if that's true, but go to wethepeopleholsters.com slash Doyle right now, get an additional $10 off with the offer code Doyle, every holster a lifetime guarantee. It's not even a problem. Not a perfect fit. Send it back. Full refund. We the people holsters.com slash Doyle. We the people holsters.com slash Doyle. Very epic. Anyways, let's get into the list. These are things that I've heard a lot from Orthodox baby boomers. But again, anybody who says these things, I would argue is a cultural or a spiritual boomer. So here we go. Number one, they're trying to divide us. They're trying to divide us by race and religion and gender and all these other things. I do agree with that, but the implication of it is not true. The implication of it is basically that the people in charge of these things are sowing divisions between people based on all these different things. And if we could only realize it and come together united, we'd be able to take control again. The problem with this is just a misunderstanding of the cause of that division. The line of thinking tends to suggest that this division is being manufactured rather than being exploited, which is what's actually happening. Because if you know anything about history, uh, you know anything about human nature, about in-group preference, et cetera, you know that these divisions between people are inevitable, like literally unavoidable. 
There's never been a successful multiracial, multiethnic, multicultural society operating under a liberal framework in the history of the world. Like we are experimenting with it right now. You tell me how you think it's going. I don't know. But this gets back into the well-meaning patriot who wishes so badly that everyone in the world would just come together under the American flag and sing the songs and love his country just as much as he does and be just as American as him. But unfortunately, that's just not the way that these things work. I wish it were, but it isn't. These immigrants are not coming here and reading the Federalist Papers and voting to preserve the foundations of this country. Lots of them do, true. But the vast majority, the vast majority are not doing that. The vast majority just view America as an economic opportunity, which I guess they feel entitled to since Americans decided that temporary incessant displays of patriotism from third world immigrants to satisfy their egos was worth like our national identity and purpose being reduced to a glorified casino. And they vote based on their group identity to achieve as much power for it as possible. So that's the reality. So it's not that the people in charge are creating this division by fanning the flames in the media, it's that they are exploiting the division that they created, that they knew was an inexorable consequence of importing tens of millions of people from the third world into this country over the course of the last 60 years. That's the correct take. The take isn't, they're trying to divide us by these things, we must unite. What are you, John Lennon? You think that that would be winning? There is nothing that the ruling class would like more than a population of people with no culture, no national identity, no religion, no anything. Just a peasant class of perpetual consumers. And that's why they've stripped all that away from you in the first place. But anyways, we continue. Number two, who are you to enforce your morality on others? John Doyle's just like a leftist. If you don't agree with his morality, he says you're a bad person. Yes. That is correct. But the difference is that I'm right and they're wrong. And I get that you've been conditioned by decades of liberal propaganda to reject the ideas of right and wrong and to believe that everything is relative. But I think that we've seen the results of that experiment and they suggest that it's time to go back to how things used to be. So yeah, not only is there right from wrong and not only do we know right from wrong, but we have an obligation to use our power, whether that's our voices or laws, to promote good in society. Well, I don't believe it's the government's job to compel individual behavior, really. Basically, every law that exists does exactly that. Speed limits, which I unironically think should be abolished, or at least we should have some sort of like system where you can buy like a pass or maybe like $1,000 a year that lets you drive however you want to, however fast you want to, I should say. But speed limits do that. Murder laws, sexual assault laws, they all compel individual behavior. So the question becomes, where do you draw the line? If you don't trust yourself to know right from wrong and to advocate for right and against wrong, then how can you support laws against murder or rape or anything, really? And if your answer to that is anarchy, then you're no different than a socialist because you're fixated on these impractical utopian ideas. The bottom line is that this country and everything about it that you love so much was built upon Christianity. That's the fact of the matter. You might not like it, but it's nonetheless true. The reason you have God-given rights is because of that. The reason this country isn't as lost as Australia right now is because of that. How can you talk about your rights as an American that you only have because of God while rejecting the concept of objective morality, which exists through God. The only reason people don't like this is because they get whiny. They get whiny when you highlight their moral behavior. Call me out of touch. Call me a Puritan, which by the way, isn't an insult. This country's moral culture back when it existed was largely influenced by the Puritans. That was a good thing. Uh, but the point is that we know what's good and we know what's bad. And if we want to have a good society instead of this like amoral vacuum of nihilism, then we have to actually stand up for good and against bad. This should be self-evident. But we continue. Number three, your problem is that you're thinking with emotion, not logic. Policies need to be judged on their results, not their intentions. Again, yes, this is true, but it doesn't really serve a purpose beyond making whoever said it feel smug because it misunderstands the reality of human nature, which is that people basically don't have agency and are not robots. Even if I were governed exclusively by facts and logic above all else, there would still have to be something inside of me that, that created that fixation. Think about it. People are not driven by facts and logic. Even you are not driven by facts and logic. This fixation on abstractions has undermined the importance of the immaterial. We are driven by the fact that we love this country. Look at the passion. Look at the passion that these protesters and rioters have. Look at the way they scream, the way that they cry and take to the streets. Do you seriously believe that if you sat down with them and proved to them that you were correct on gun control, gun policy, that the very next day they'd be back out there, except this time they'd be channeling that passion in favor of your side? No, they'd probably just say, well, I just have to do more research and then just stick to what they already believe. Lived experiences, passions, these are the things that compel people. These are the things that compel people to fight, right? Politics isn't about truth. It should be, it's not. It's about people and people are prideful. They are ego invested into these things. They are largely influenced by their lived experiences. And if you can structure a society that basically breeds mental illness and then simultaneously create victim narratives for people to sympathize with, you could consolidate a decent amount of power pretty quickly, couldn't you? There's a reason that these people like break down into tears when you, when you debate with them. 
And the grand irony is that you laugh at them as if they're the ones who don't get what's going on. No, you don't get what's going on. You don't get how bad things in this country are, where these people are so sick that they can't have a disagreement about politics without literally crying. And you think it's just because you like owned them so hard with facts and logic. No, you don't get it. And these people are dangerously close to having total power over you. Do you think that they're just gonna leave you alone? They're not. And again, this doesn't mean that we should be thinking with emotions and ignore facts. This is just to say that we have to be honest with our situation. And if we want to win, we have to simultaneously figure out how to cure widespread societal nihilism while configuring our policies or reconfiguring them, I should say, to appeal to people's emotions and experiences instead of, frankly, their pride. Like, hey, smart people only talk about facts and logic. So if you want to be a smart person like me, only talk about facts and logic. That's not how you take a country back. That's how you make a substantial personal fortune by declaring that there are only two genders basically, but we continue. Number four, this is too far. We need to go back to insert previous stage of liberalism that was predicted to lead to this. And this is always the case. Third wave feminism is too far, but I like original feminism. Critical race theory is too far, but I like Martin Luther King Jr. He wouldn't have supported this. Really? The astroturf communist activist Martin Luther King Jr. who wrote in his journals about things exactly like critical race theory, he wouldn't have supported it. Really? Then why do all the veterans of the civil rights movement who marched alongside him, why do they support it? That's a red pill most conservatives are not ready for, the MLK pill. Oh, but John, MLK advocated for peaceful demonstrations. Oh, like peaceful protests? Who told you that, your public school history teacher? Just like Antifa is just an idea, right? Just like 93% of Black Lives Matter protests two summers ago were peaceful, right? Do you understand that almost everything you were ever taught about history is a lie? They're writing the history books because they won. And as they keep winning and writing history books, your kids are going to be taught that Antifa and Black Lives Matter are just ideas that are peaceful. And my sons, all seven of them, are gonna have to red pill your kids. And then you're gonna witness history repeating itself because people online in the 2050s will be writing, the mass execution of conservatives is not what Black Lives Matter was about as a George Floyd conservative. <laughs> that's literally, that's going to be, that's like literally what's going to happen. George Floyd conservatism. And I'll say this about boomers because it's a double-edged sword since they can't accept that things have changed. So like on the one hand, they're like, no, we just need small government and Ronald Reagan and the cold war still happening, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, you can never get them to buy into something like gender theory. Like I don't buy it either, but I at least, I understand what they're saying, right? Like the philosophical question of what defines manhood, womanhood, do they intersect? Like I get what they're saying, but boomers just go, no, it's male and female, basic biology. And I love that about them. And we're gonna miss that a lot. If you think that this country is going down with boomers holding power, just wait until millennials start replacing them in the next 10 years, then we're really gonna be screwed, blued, and tattooed. But I bring that up because I was talking about something related to this with my mom the other day, and she goes, well, what do you think about Martin Luther King Jr.? And I go, you think I like Martin Luther King? And she goes, well, I don't know. You know, my brother never liked him. And I was like, let's flipping go. Based Uncle Rob, the Maverick strikes again. But here's the point. We don't like feminism because it is the complete inversion of reality. It is built upon the idea that man and woman are equal. Not that they should be treated with equal dignity, but like literally that they are equal. That is untrue. That is unnatural. And it's actually satanic, which could be why less than a hundred years later, child sacrifice is completely normalized in our culture. But when you accept that idea, then anything else is totally fair game because you will have established the slope and it's a slippery one as you can clearly see by this point or even MLK same thing the principles enshrined by the civil rights movement were expected to have consequences and exactly what was predicted has come true what happens when you legally enshrine equality not just between men and women but everyone and then when that equality doesn't happen because not everyone's equal you get things like critical race theory Affirmative action, all of it, it's unavoidable. So it's not enough to say, well, we just need to get back to earlier stages of liberal ideas because those ideas are what led to this in the first place. And the reason people even think that in the first place is because of the liberal conditioning that they've been experiencing for their entire lives. Well, you know what, John? Maybe I am a liberal. Well, then maybe you're the problem. Yeah, I already knew that. I already knew that you're not conservative. That's why we're here in the first place. Anyways, last one. This one's actually my least favorite. Oh, just you wait and see. Just red wave imminence. It's like this eternal fixation on being as smug as possible. I just don't get it. I feel like I'm chaperoning children when I listen to these takes. If Joe Biden does a vaccine mandate, it'll actually be racist against black people since they're the least likely to get vaccinated. <laughs> Joe Biden let all these people from Latin America come into the country, but then when some Haitian people came in, he started sending them back. So in other words, it was only when black people started showing up that he had a problem with it. <laughs> 
Do you think you're cute? Like, do you think that this is clever? Oh, I'm going to operate within the left's moral framework and then pretend that I'm winning because this time I get to call them the racist. You're actually a child. Like, I'm sorry, but this is true. Like, this is so sophomoric. Like, what a real conservative you are when the best argument that you can think of against vaccine mandates is that it would be unfair to black people. The biggest one, though, this idea of the silent majority. <laughs> Just you wait and see. When Carter was in office, we had inflation. We had gas prices through the roof. And then people got mad. And then Reagan came and swept the country. And it was a landslide. Oh, just you wait. The same thing's happening now with Biden. Just you wait. Trump's going to come back and history's going to repeat itself. Really? The country that has become about 50% less trusting of its own people and about 25% less white since 1980, that's the country that's going to have a Republican landslide in a federal election? White people are the only demographic that by majority vote for Republicans. We've been winning federal elections by smaller margins every cycle because of immigration, because of demographic change. Everybody knows this. The left celebrates this. This is not at all controversial. Are you going to change their minds? With what institutional power? Do you think that this country is unified enough to have an election be a landslide, let alone it be a Republican? No, that country's long gone. And frankly, it's because the boomers, even more frankly, the greatest generation, they didn't defend it competently. They just don't get it. They and their parents grew up in the most prosperous generation in human history. You lived in leisure and you let this happen, perhaps understandably after having come out of World War II, which we shouldn't have even been involved in in the first place anyways. Frankly, that's another red pill that people aren't ready for. The World War II dissertation imminent, perhaps. But in summary, we are living through the direct result of a decadent mindset. You cannot expect to be apathetic, to be amoral, and just for everything to sustain itself. Do we now understand the results of this little sit back and do nothing experiment? Those types of people are not gonna be in control anymore, and they don't deserve to be. We are going to take this country back, and we are going to do so by putting people with spines into power, as opposed to putting people without spines into power who pretend that their cowardice or indifference is some sort of virtue. This is a song about the leader of our movement who 30 years ago today went to go buy something from the store. The nanny state said that he was using counterfeit currency, but when you think about it, fiat currency is just as valuable as fake currency, and the police didn't like that. So they killed him because he was a Keynes, he was a, he was a, an Austrian economics guy, just like us. His name was George Floyd. And today we commemorate the loss of the face of modern conservatism, George Floyd. Where are you? And I'm so sorry, I cannot sleep, cannot dream tonight. I need somebody and always. This fentanyl's toxic, like surprisingly toxic, it's a problem. And as I stared, I counted the black people on the sidewalk recording me so I could go viral. Like when we had St. Martin and before him Trayvon, will you come home and rob my pregnant girlfriend? Rob my pregnant girlfriend. Miss you, I miss you. Waste your time on me, you're already the voice inside my head. George Floyd, don't waste your time on me, you're already the voice inside my head. George Floyd, we miss you because it's the 2050s and we're George Floyd conservatives. Um, this is a song called Subscribe to the Channel. This is, this is the campfire when we have the compound. We do a little subscribe into the channel, turning on post notifications, sharing the video with a friend, leaving a like, and also leaving a comment. If you want, this, that, that was so esoteric. This is actually the most esoteric outro in the history of the channel. 
for the three year anniversary almost, we just have to get more esoteric with the two minute outros. You have to know the case. De- Should I ruin it? I'll ruin it because that makes it more esoteric. Because sometimes I don't ruin it. So we have to add an additional layer of esotericism. So you have to know the case details. Well, first of all, you have to be familiar with the concept of the two-minute outro. Then you have to be familiar with the case details of the George Floyd thing. Then you have to be familiar with that song by Blink-182. Then you have to be familiar with Tom DeLonge leaving Blink, going on a tour with Angels and Airwaves in the summer and fall of 2019, doing a medley where he played a, a bunch of songs, starting with the I Miss You acoustic version. There's just so many things that you just have to know. You really just have to take all these things into account for it to make sense. It's, it's, it's really kind of a high IQ thing. You kind of have to have a high IQ to, to really understand what that whole thing was about. It was kind of meta in a way, which I don't care to explain right now because we are approaching probably the three and a half minute outro. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. Poof.